Yes, it's Ana Costa from Iowa, University of Iowa. Um, we're fellow Brazilians, so we met through, I guess, uh, uh, some conversations about the future of South America, and we've been talking a lot about that this week here. But today he's going to tell us about asset pricing, quantile preferences, and equity technologies. Thank you very much, Carlos, for the invitation. Thank you, everyone, for coming. This is our project with uh, Antonio Galvão that used to be in Iowa, and, but now in Michigan State. And Tom Bial is a professor of finance in the University of Iowa. So, Antonio is a econometrician. I do mostly theory, and uh, Tong is a finance professor. So, we got together and uh, arranged this uh, piece of uh, ideas. So, let me talk, tell you what this is about. So I would like to start talking about spectral utility that uh, most of you, I mean, at least if you have seen something on economics, have worked with spectral utility. So what's the what spectral utility? Spectral utility is a way to choose uh, between risk lotteries. So if I present you X and Y, uh, you are going to prefer X over Y. So this is just two lotteries, right? Think about uh, uh, gambles. And if you're going to prefer, prefer X to Y over Y, if the expected utility of X is greater than the expected utility of Y. This is uh, the basic framework of choice under risk in economics. And it has been with us, at least in economics, uh, at least in the, since the 50s. But actually, uh, and I'm going to show you, we, are, we have been working with this for more than 200 years, right? It's a very old idea. Uh, since the beginning, when uh, it was proposed, people started to realize that there were a lot of problems with spectral utility. And, um, but most of the problems that are uh, referred to in spectral utility, for instance, the LA paradox, the Osbeck paradox, Laws of aversion that led to Kenneth uh, uh, pro uh, prospect theory. All these, all these things here, in, in general, they are related to one shot decision. So you make a decision is that is just you're facing one stage of risk and you made the choice according to spectral utility, and you have all these problems. When you deal with dynamic programming, and dynamic programming is uh, a situation where you make a decision in multiple uh, stages, right? And this, for instance, if you want to make an investment in asset pricing, you invest today, but then tomorrow you're going to make another decision. So it's a sequence of decisions. Then you have to, uh, and each, each uh, period face a new risk, you have to reconsider what you do, and you reconsider using spectral utility. It's much less known the problems that you face in spectral utility in this dynamic framework. So let me point out just uh, two problems or one problem. That's the fact that spectral utility puts together two things that in economics are very different. One is risk aversion, and the other is intertemporal preference. So let me explain this. And to explain this, let's just focus on a very simple case without risk. So, and then we do, we can just understand what's going on. And then I will put risk back. Okay. So, without risk, we don't need, need to talk about uh, expected utility because there is no risk. So, there is nothing to be expected about, right? So, how do you decide? It's a classic problem of dynamic problem. You have a cake, and each period you take a slice of the cake and eat, and save the rest of the cake for tomorrow. So the point that you eat is the CT, each period, and you leave for tomorrow. But uh, tomorrow, the consumption tomorrow is valued less than consumption today. How valued less? By discounted value. So this is the way that you plan the consumption of the, 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 the cake, through time, because you plan how many, how, how big the slices you cut every time. And you can either write in this way, or you can write in the recursive form. It's important the recursive form because this is what is used and it's very useful from now on. So, but I would say that this is equivalent to this, in this problem, because XT is the size of the cake, is the state that you have. 
And then you cut this XT in two parts. One is for consumption today, sorry. Uh, the consumption today is a CT, and then you save something, XT plus one, uh, for tomorrow. And then you value this uh, using this uh, formula. The interesting thing, and then now I come back to speculative. I'm going very slow just to, because this is the conceptual part and it's interesting to understand. Uh, how concave this function is determines how fast you eat the cake. So if uh, it's linear, you eat with a certain speed. If it's more concave, more and more concave, you, you eat with a different speed. So, and there is a name for this in economics, the elasticity of intertemporal substitution, how you substitute your consumption across time. And this is defined by the concave of you, okay? So the, the concave of you, how curved it is, defines elasticity of intertemporal substitution. Okay. And, but, but of course, beta as well, right? So. Yeah, so this is the interesting thing. There are two parts here of uh, how you substitute, right? How uh, the cake varies in the future and the concurrent. There are two parts, but they are very different parts, right? So one thing is, uh, so think about one, one, instead of eating a cake, it could be ice cream and it's melting. The beta T is how fast it melts, right? And then if you save tomorrow, then you are going to have less. But the U also tells you how well, the U has a, so one of the characteristics of the U here is that uh, if you have a very bad uh, uh, U like this, the utility for very small pieces is very, very bad. So what you want, you don't want to get a small piece because it's very bad to you. So you want to save a lot. And this is not determined by the beta, it is determined by the U, okay? Okay, so far so good. Remember, no risk aversion. Now let's put risk aversion. Okay? So how the expected utility use of this? Well, the expected utility use of this by uh, putting a expected expectation here on the continuation. And the U plays exactly the same role. But now the U determines also the risk aversion. So it continues to determine the elasticity of the substitution, the concept of U, and now it determines also the risk aversion. But these things are different objects from an economic perspective. One thing is how you decide the temporal. The other thing is how you face risk. Okay, and I'm going to, uh, if you don't get this yet, uh, uh, I will explain a little bit more because I'm going to talk about, uh, uh, I, I'm glad that I, I did this for this talk, because I had a discussion about the uh, St. Pittsburgh paradox, which is the beginning of expected utility, and I'll come back and explain a little bit more what, uh, why, why risk aversion appears even in this history of these things. But, uh, let me just go back to a big picture of this paper. Uh, the big picture is that this problem that I just explained to you, the, the fact that the speculative ties together risk of virtual analysis or terrible substitution, was a problem that was uh, uh, discovered or realized and talked about on Hall in 78. Uh, and they said, well, we have to do something about this because these are two different economic objects or concepts. How will you deal with it? Well, Hall didn't have a tool, but then you came with Epstein's in a very famous paper, uh, 5,000 citations. Actually, they have two, one 5,000, another 4,000. It's a very well known and cited paper in finance and micro. Uh, what they, they come and they propose a preference that is able to separate risk aversion from losses of the substitution. It's a big deal. It's, it's really a big deal in macroeconomics economics and uh, generally a lot of stuff. Uh, and of course, it's also using asset pricing, uh, which is the focus of the paper today. So let me tell you uh, what this paper is about. One thing that actually, just a comment about the extreme uh, puzzle. So now we talk about philosophy of science, right? Uh, you could say in a very pedestrian way 
that uh, the act of freedom of also is, it could be understood as a falsification of speculative. What it does it say? Well, you have a theory and it has some prediction. You get the prediction to the data and the data falsifies it. How? The parameters that you need in the speculative model to explain the act of freedom of are just absurd. It doesn't, uh, it doesn't make any sense. And in some sense, then it's just uh, another way of putting. I, I don't know if you have. Uh, I, I, I don't remember having seen pe people framing in this way, but you could say that it's a falsification of speculative. So this all tells us that you have to consider different models. By the way, if you ask, and I'm going to talk about this, this preference also do not uh, uh, work well with the experiment, and I'll show you in this case. Okay. So we need to consider different uh, objects or projects, and this is what we, we, this paper does. We propose a model where instead of the expected utility, it's a very similar kind of a model. There is just one difference. Instead of uh, taking the expectation of the continuation, I take a quantile, which is a statistical object that's very close in mathematically from expectation. And if you don't know these quantiles, I, I'll, I'll, I'll explain this in a moment. So, but uh, just to, to tell what this paper does, we put this model, actually this is a model that we published before in, in 2019, in the uh, and what we did now was to include this for asset price model, develop the asset price model, and look at the, what the, this model tells about that premium puzzle, okay? And what we find is that, uh, remember, I said that the premium puzzle is a falsification of speculative. It's not a falsification for a model. Why? Because the, when you take this to the data, the parameters that you get, and I'll explain this in a moment, are very reasonable. And I'm going to try to convince you of that. Let me just add uh, uh, one question. So this is not a change in preferences. It's a change in the paradigm that a decision maker faces. And he's finding a different well, the paradigm the decision maker takes the same utility, you, but now uh, look to the process of making decision in light of that you in the context of, of, of this quantile. Max minor quantile. Yeah. A, a language of decision fear, uh, the, the language that decision fears express this that you have just said, is to say that they have a different preference for risk uh, attitudes or logics. So instead of max or maximal speculative, they maximize quantile. Yeah. Okay. So it's still, it's still, it's still it's a different it's a, it's a different paradigm, sure. But you can also say, and you could find in, in uh, theoretical or economic papers saying this is a different preference. So contrast that with Epstein's in. So Epstein's in is just a different view, right? I'm going. I'm, I think I have a, a. It's a little bit more complex than that. Okay. I will show uh, Epstein's in, but uh, you're completely right. The comparison is exactly with Herbstein Z. And we, as they uh, propose a different preference, these are different preference in exactly the same sense. Okay. And they have two parameters one for risk of worship and one another for elastic or temporal substitution. And this model also does. The, the, the difference is that uh, I would argue, and I'll show why, it's a simpler model. Okay, so, but let me uh, try to, as I promised, history. So perhaps this is my interesting. I actually am like, uh, I'm glad that it's recorded because now I can claim that uh, we did this. So I don't know if you know how expected utility uh, came about. It was in the 18th century. So Pascal had uh, proposed uh, answering a question for his friend, Chevalier uh, de Man, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, he asked him to know how to bet, right? How to make bets. And then Pascal, talking with Fermat, said, Well, we have to calculate the expectation of uh, the lotteries, and then probability uh, was born this way. And then in 1713, Nicholas uh, Ben Louis came with this game. Suppose that you pay, uh, you pay a a coin, a toss a coin, uh, if it heads is two dollars, if it tails, you play again. If it heads four dollars, if not, play again. And then you keep going, and every time that you play, doubles. 
Okay. Okay. So, no problem. Let's uh, see what the Pascal method does. Well, if you if you do this and try to calculate what uh, Pascal suggests you should do to calculate the expected value of this logic, it turns out that it's just the infinite, right? So this means that according to Pascal, we have to sell everything that you have just to play this game. And the question is, would you? Nobody would, right? Uh, uh, so it doesn't work. There's something wrong here. And because of that, uh, Daniel ben who was living in St. Petersburg, it was uh, for the same family, he came up with the idea of using spectral utility. Actually, this is an interesting thing because he's a mathematician, got the idea of his utility from economists, uh, because economists were doing this, Bentham would work with uh, utility. Oh, well, well, let's take this idea and use it. So instead of uh, calculating the expectation of the original value, you're going to apply a utility on it and then calculate the expectation. Uh, and then the expected utility framework uh, came out. The interesting thing is that uh, what I'm going to propose to you in a moment is that uh, there is another alternative of solving this. And in some sense, uh, this guy wrote a book on quantile regression, it's a famous book. He said, well, what we're going to do with quantile regression is instead of uh, using expectations, use quantiles, and it's just to come back to the initial uh, times of statistics. But uh, with quantiles, you can solve this very simply. So you take this lottery, What's the quantile of the lottery? I mean, you can calculate. I'm not going to define quantiles in a moment. But uh, if you pay anything in an interval, it's always finite if the quantile is finite. Uh, I, uh, wait a minute, I'm going to uh, define this. But uh, the, the point is that you could explain the uh, subject book paradox just using quantiles instead of expectation. So what's the point here? The point is, well, there is a parallel universe, parallel to this, where uh, Nicholas Bernoulli would come up with, instead of spectral utility, a quantile. That's a statistical uh, property that actually is preserved in law of large numbers. So if you think about what's the probability, uh, if you, if you toss uh, the coin many, many times, and you fix a probability that's tau, uh, the, the probability that, that these uh, repetitions will come up exactly the quantile. So it would be a statistical very natural, and you don't need this strange thing of utilities. It would be a solution. Uh, so, well, in some sense, what we, when we consider quantile process, let's go back 300 years and then consider an alternative path that we could have done, right? Um, so let me, I promise to define it. Quantile is just a uh, inverse of the CDF, if you have a CDF. So you look at, uh, it's a probability, a number between 0 and 1, and this number you fix like, it could be 50%, you take the inverse and it gives the quantile, okay? Uh, of course, if uh, the CDF, the distribution is not invertible, you you take the generalized inverse. And then the quantile preference is to, to say that instead of evaluating the thing with the expectation, you evaluate with uh, quantiles, okay? So all this is that, that is, so what I'm confused is that you have to fix a tau. 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 And uh, for, for example, now, the St. Petersburg paradox, if I just do tau with one half, so I'm looking at a sort of median. Then it will be two or four. 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 You play four. Yeah. yeah. That's that's exactly what because then there is the median. Right. Uh, so I'm keeping here you, but I'll uh, take out you in a moment, okay? Uh, but uh, and I put this just to make exactly the parallel with expectation. And for now, it's just one period. And I'm just trying to explain the, the one period. So if you think about what expectation does, it just takes a certain equivalent of the distribution of this random variable, that's u of x, right? It takes a certain equivalent. Uh, what the quantile does is takes another certain equivalent, for a low tau, it's close to this side of the distribution. For a high tau, it's this side of the distribution. But of course, as you vary tau, 
you can vary uh, across the support of the bar. Okay? So this is the quantile. So once you fix a tau, you have to fix a tau to have a specific number. And if you maximize, so and one thing is, if you fix a very low tau, as we have here, it means that you're looking uh, to low values, right? It's like, uh, and I'm going to show there is a sense in which this is like pessimism. And if you look in here, you are kind of looking at the good uh, outcomes, right? Um, so uh, let me argue that this preference is not so crazy as it may seem. And uh, at least in my universe, I don't know what you do here, but in my universe, we do this for evaluation of professors. I am evaluated this way. How? Well, think about these two professors here, A and B. I'm not going to tell you who I am. <laughs> <laughs> and then you get here 10, 10, 10, 10, and I got this V0. And the other one is 7, 8, 8, and the 10. You calculate the average. So think about what's the best professor here? What do you say? A is better, right? So there is a crazy guy here that gets a, got annoyed with this professor and gets a zero, but zero is not a good one. So this guy is clearly is a better professor. You take the average, and A is better than worse than B. And, and actually, this is actually what we do in Iowa. We take the medians of the evaluations, not the averages, right? You're better than us. Huh? You're better than us. You have yeah. It's a, it's a, yeah, it's, I've had multiple points but, now. But, but, the, but it's a problem. You can see that's a problem. <laughs> it's a new problem. <laughs> uh, but, uh, so let me, let me give another example that I think that the uh, context seems very reasonable. Think about a politician choosing a policy that will impact the distribution of income for population. And this politician is looking for election. He looks at minim, uh, maximize the median voter. So he looks at the distribution of the median and try to maximize the well-being of that median guy. Well, you can think of a politician that uh, is kind of Rawlsian and looks at the bad, the bad guy, you know, the poor guy, and it maybe takes a 10%. Rawls would be a 0.71%. <laughs> You can you, you, you made there are problems with uh, getting so low, but uh, you get the point, right? So if you look at the poor guy, you would look at how. But uh, then you can get the dictator. He's looking just at uh, satisfying the, the, his coalition, and then he can maximize a, a high contact. So it seems that uh, this is exactly what this politician should be doing. And uh, I can give one example. So uh, one paper that I have with Antonio also that's up to maximization. Quantile preference is pretty much, together with all the axioms, but pretty much is the only one that allows you to separate taste from beliefs. Is this important? Yes, it's important. Because if I go to a specialist and ask, what's the probability that Trump is going to be elected? And the specialists say, oh my god, Trump would be terrible, we don't want him, or Trump will be good. Look, I'm not asking if you like him or not, I'm asking you to tell me what's the probability of him being elected, re-elected, right, re elected. So I want you to separate your tastes from the outcome, from your beliefs. And uh, I'm not, I don't have time to explain this here. Speculative cannot do this. So you mix together the tastes the utility with your beliefs, and these things you cannot separate. Quantile is pretty much the only one, uh, I mean, you need all axioms, but it's pretty much the only one that separates these two parts, taste and beliefs. Uh, we have done two papers on experiments and uh, put uh, people in the laboratory, and this, uh, I have to confess, this surprised me because I didn't expect people to actually behave uh, as quantile maximizers. And this, my co-authors came in and said, look, uh, actually, depending on the, the, the thing is that you have a bunch of choices, some will be classified as spectral field, some will be quantile maximized, depending on how you count, because some people will make mistakes. Depending on how you make mistakes, you can get uh, from 32 to 55% of people being quantile maximized instead of spectral maximized. And you have done this also for, uh, um, uh, experiment in portfolio choice, and the results are similar. So it's not a majority, but uh, there are 
people that could be better described as quantum mathematics. Binary choices. So I offer you the choice between two lotteries. So let's say 50% you get $10, 50% uh, you get uh, zero. And the other one, I don't know, you get uh, $20 with 30% and zero with uh, 70%. And then what do you choose? I, I put a lot of different choice like this. And I see, I think I try to calibrate the best parameter that describes your choice. And then I see from the best models, what's the model that better describe your choice? Is the speculative model or the quantum uh, model? So these numbers here are exactly the proportion of people for which the quantum model is better. That's it? In the better, when I, I'm just comparing two models, speculative to quantum, it's just a horse race. I have a bunch of choices. I pick the best horse, which is the cal calibration of the parameters for the speculative, the best horse for the quantum, the best calibration of parameters, and I put them together to see who wins. Okay. Okay, so. Uh, of course, I'm just trying to sell what type of programs, right? Well, and then uh, up to some point, the 10 minutes in the talk, I'm just saying good things. Let me say the bad things. It's not the great. There are some problems. So first, the mathematical problems. It's very hard to work with quantize. <laughs> Expectations are great names, very nice. They are linear. They, they have the law of iterative expectation. You collapse all the expectations to just uh, the last one. Just fantastic, right? Forget about this. In quantize, we have a lot of problems, technical problems to work with. First of all, it's not linear. You can take out constants if they are positive, but not all. For expectation, it's, uh, it is for all alpha. And it's not uh, uh, additive. So this, this is a big problem already to work with. And it creates problem, technical problems. Another one that's uh, a difficult thing to deal with is to put uh, derivatives inside quantize. So if you think about the, if this guy is bounded, for instance, uh, the derivative expectation, you can just put the expectation uh, derivative inside as the expectation of the derivative, and it's very convenient to work with. This is not true for quantize, and the other one is the law of the expectations. That's not true also for quantize. So. Quantile of quantile is not one quantile. You have to keep the, the, the things. There's another problem here is that in the end, it may be a problem, but it can also be a kind of a, a good thing. Quantiles don't look at the upsides. Right? What's important is that downside. Right? Because think about a lot. Of, let's suppose that I have a lot of here, two outcomes. As I said, 10 and 0. Oh, Maybe with main outcomes, uh, 10 until 1, and then you maybe let's, let's say that you get a 4, right, for the quantum. And then instead of a 10, I start increasing it, 10 to 1,000, 1 million. The quantum doesn't change. The expectation will change, right? The quantum doesn't change. So the things that are, you are increasing, they're making better in the upside, the quantum will not look at it. And this is exactly why uh, Hostec, who uses this term, term knowledge, she introduced, uh, say, said that quantiles look at the downside risk. What is, you look just to one side, you don't look at uh, the upside. And there are some uh, uh, people, including uh, Warren Buffett, who said that, well, risky, you have to look at the downside, not the upside. So we, we call this in our uh, papers, or just to say that uh, perhaps this is a good thing to to take an account. Okay, and I'm going to explain the downside risk in a moment. But let me just uh, say a very nice property of quantize that expectations do not have. I said that these ones are the ones that are bad ones for quantize. Now one very good, a very good one is this one. For any one of the uh, quantize are just uh, ordinal. For any monotonic transformation. You can just uh, uh, switch the order with quantiles. So 
for instance, f here could be log. The log of the expectation. This is not true for expectation. The log of the expectation is not the expectation of the log. Right? Actually. But for quantized it is. So you can invert these things. Or exponentiations. And this property is uh, very convenient for, because of this property in all the papers, not in this one. We are able to, in a lot of dynamic models, we are able to get closed form solutions because you get these things got outside and simplify things. You get a closed form solution for a dynamic model where for expectation, the only thing that you can have is a numerical solution. And then with this model, because of this property, we can get a closed form solution. But that has another application. The application of uh, uh, something that I said before, but I'll explain now. Utilities do not matter here. Why? So if you took the utility, as I explained before, you take the inverse of the utility, right? It's just a monotone transformation, the utility increase, it's the same thing, and then you can put it inside and then it disappears. So now that's a very nice property that utilities do not matter for the one shot decision. And this is the reason why you can separate risk aversion from the last or terrible substitution. You remember how the risk aversion came from the utility? The utility, you cannot do this for the expected The utility is important, right? It's the whole point about uh, expected this is utility. Now, in the start case, the utility doesn't matter. Now think about, remember the cake, the cake eating problem? The cake, the utility defines how you define the cake. Now it has the same property, nothing to do with uh, risk aversion, because it does not have anything to do with risk aversion. Risk aversion is a clear. But the, how you fast you eat the cake, which is the term that assists of the substitution, has exactly the same role that it has in the not risk uh, version. Okay? So this means that, uh, therefore, that uh, in the dynamic setting, you will determine the assistant of a specific. I'm a little confused with the terminology here. So I can see that you're not depending on the utility. So the, the, how you pass to eat the cake is no longer depending on you. It's still depending on, of course, no. the, the melting so, of the ice cream. Uh, and no, the, how fast, so, so you're putting dynamic model. So, what, uh, so there are two separate things. Remember that uh, uh, in the static sense, the U is just about risk of motion. It wants static, it's right, once, once. Okay, got it. Once. Yeah. Yes. And this I'm talking about one. The static, the That's utility, right. and, and then the utility doesn't matter. And I think, well, there is a risk of version yet. Yes, there is risk of version. Do you know where? It's just in front of you. Can you tell me where it's risk of version here? The tau. Tau is the one that's in terms of risk of version. It's actually it's a very simple parameter to understand. I was in Petrobras when my paper, this paper was published, the previous paper was published. An administrator there asking me, can you explain your paper to me? And I said, well, <laughs> the guy was not an economist. Was... And then I tried to explain, well, economists look risk of expected utility. What we do is just uh, use quantile. I said, no, make more sense to use quantile. Because he were used, he were used to the idea of quantile. Quantile is a thing that's very simple to understand. I think what the spectrum did, not, not even know where to teach risk aversion with uh, expected utility. We do some calculation. The MBA students do not learn expected utility in the MBA course uh, in Calgary, for instance. Hmm. Uh, but uh, I think that this would be useful to, to learn. What I'm saying is that when we go back to this dynamic setting, who will play a role? And what will be the role? Exactly the role that you have in a model without risk, which is the speed of eating the cake. It's exactly the one that comes from the, 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 the model without risk. So let me explain the risk uh, attitude here. And uh, okay. uh, so think about two, uh, two variables, x and y. Okay. So if you think about this, this is the CDF, the distribution of the x and y. So this CDF here of y is much more concentrated than the x. Can you see? Because it increases a lot. I, I don't know if uh, 
comes this trigger, but <laughs> uh, if, you, if, you, if you see this, this means that there's a lot of weight around this register. And for X, it's much more widespread. There's a lot of weight here. So X can uh, happen here with some probability uh, for this. And the, the bad outcomes for X and the, bad, the good outcomes for X. So X is much more widespread. So you can see if you have this situation where the, the, C, uh, the CDF of Y crosses the CDF of X from below, this means that X has more downside risk than Y. It's more risky. Okay? That clear this? So now let's think about how a quantile maximizer looks at this. Okay? Remember that uh, the, max, the quantile maximizer is the inverse of the CDF. So let's say that I take a small tau. And I look, what's the quantile of tau of X? It's right here. Right? What's the quantile tau of y right here? What's bigger? Y. So what's the lottery that's chosen? Y. So for low tau, for any tau below the point where they cross, what the maximizer, tau maximizer choose? The safer one. Now what happens with uh, high tau? Let's say this tau prime here. This is the quantile of tau prime of y, this is one tau prime of x, who is bigger? Of x. So what's your choice? If you are tau prime maximizer, you choose the riskier one. So this has a sense in which as you increase tau, you become more and more risk lower. You take more risky choices. If you get a low tau, you, you are much more cautious and you take safer choice. Okay? So, the tau is just the parameter that uh, measures risk in this model. Okay? So yes? So, when you think about risk, you say there's a trade-off. Um, what do you mean? So, the, the way that we deal with risk in this model is very different from the way that we deal with the spectral utilities. It's almost orthogonal. It's not exactly orthogonal because there's a lot of overlap, but they're different. So this is why actually we say we, don't, we try to avoid the, the terminology of this conversion. Although you may find here, I, you may hear me saying, uh, yeah, don't, what we call here is downside risk conversion because a different attitude is you you are looking at it through the quantile model, and it's not exactly speculative. I have some slides at the, at the end. If you want, I can try to, in a very particular set of variables, to compare how the, the, the risk aversion in the normal model compares with this model. Okay. Uh, so here is the Epstein Z model without uh, uncertainty. So remember, this is the, the, our model without uncertainty, right? If you take a, a, our preference and you, let's say, what happens if you collapse the uncertainty of the model? What do you obtain? You obtain exactly the original model without uh, uncertainty, the one that uh, the, the cake eating problem that I described. If you do H times Z, this is what you get. So it's one thing inside of the other. So what? So I can tell you what's the Epstein's in preference in general. What they do is, as they do uh, rec uh, recursive, there is expectation here. You have to do one of a hole, and then put a, a hole, and then the, these things get. There, there are a bunch of uh, expectations here. In our model, there will be quantiles, uh, although you can simplify a little bit. But the point is, take Epstein's in, Collapse the uncertainty. This is what you get. And uh, at least in our model, you get back to the original one that you want you the exponential utility. Okay. Okay, so now it's more finance, I'll, I'll be quicker because perhaps uh, less people are interested in this. But uh, this is a very standard model of uh, asset pricing. Okay. So how it goes, uh, you have a bunch of assets today, 
the assets free a dividend, and you can sell those. Right? This is what you get today at the beginning of the period T. What you can do, you can consume something. It's like uh, what the pacing of the cake, the cake that you take to eat, and then you save for tomorrow. You save for tomorrow how? You buy this amount of assets by the price that you fix. And then next period, you're going to have this amount of assets. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. So it's a very, this is, this is the standard thing. Of course, this determines, uh, I'm sorry, this determines uh, the consumption, right? Well, nothing different here. Let me tell you, so all the budgets are uh, exactly equal. Let me show you where the model is different. So in the standard model, you have a, a value function that's a function of how much assets you have today and what's the shock of the economy. In the, and then you buy a consumption exactly as I described to you, and you evaluate in the standard model of expectation of what comes next. Here, the difference is the quantile. So that is the only difference. And the, the thing is, what we're going to do here is, what's the implication in terms of price for this model? Okay. Um, and uh, the, the, the first, I mean, after, I'm not, I'm, I'm, I saved the theorems. If you want, that problem there, I can show you. They are there, they exist, but I have uh, 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 skin. What I want to do is just to show you the parallels. This is the asset pricing formula that you get from the standard model. Your price today is expectation of something tomorrow. And I'm going to talk a little bit more about this, but this is stock assets gun factor and a sequence of a price and dividends. What you get is the our model is of, is almost the same equation with one difference, the quantile. And they say, well, this is not surprising. Yeah, it's not surprising. But it's behind the scenes, it's, that, uh, it's more difficult. Because you remember, there are a lot of problems to work with quantile. It's not uh, uh, linear. It's not uh, well, the other stuff, right? You, you have problems with putting this derivative together. We have to do a lot of uh, tricks to get around all these problems. But at the end, the whole thing works very I guess, nice. I guess it is surprising that it works the same. Well, yeah, but the difficulties of working on that. <laughs> yeah, so so actually there is one guy that uh, worked with uh, with quantiles. I started to say what uh, before the paper was published. He he had worked with quantiles before, and I said, well, this is what I have tried to do, say. And then he had worked with quantiles, and his his comment before I said that we got it, he said, well, there is no way that this will work. <laughs> but uh, fortunately, uh, we made it work. So let me show you what's the implication, one of the implications. So one, one of the things is you go back to finance, you go Cochrane, there's a wonderful book of finance, asset pricing uh, in finance. What you get is the price of the asset is the stock asset factor times the X, that's the price for the dividend. If there is no dividend, it's just the price for one. And this is exactly the, the point, Richard, where you should understand, right? <laughs> You've got the, exactly the right moment, because uh, what I'm saying is that, that this is how you get the expectation of the price from today, right? For, this is the standard model. This is what you find in the equation of uh, page, page four of Cochrane's. So what's the model that you get now? It's the same model. And this, I think, that is nice, because uh, you don't need to learn a lot of uh, new things. The only thing that you have to choose is Change expectation by quantile. So here's in the uh, quantile. One thing that uh, this leads you is the following thing, and I think that uh, at least for my taste is interesting. Uh, if you, uh, uh, this is also a notation from Cochrane. Okay, he calls this term here stochastic factor and, and writes this equation. This is equation 1.4. It's at the beginning of the control. The price is the expectation of the stochastic factor times x which is how much it's value tomorrow. Uh, our equation is this one. It's pretty, it's pretty much the same. So one implication of this is, uh, is the following. If you look at this, where is this conversion? 
Yeah. Tap. It's very clear. You, you look there and it's clear. In Zosto, you can tell exactly what Tau does for the model, right? And uh, this is summarized very, very simple here. If, uh, remember, if an agent becomes more downside with conversion, it means Tau go down, right? If you look at here, uh, sorry, if you go look, look at here, what happens if you, are, this, is a, this is a distribution of things to model. If you look at lower Tau, what happens to B? Goes down, right? So there is a, a, a nice economic interpretation. If the, the agents become more risk averse, the prices in the model go down, which kind of seems reasonable, but it's not true in other models, which is kind of a surprising. For speculative, a lot of different models, including specializing, you need to add different assumptions to get this very simple result. Uh, but uh, let me tell you another thing that I like. And now it has a lot of uh, math. Oh, I should skip this, right? Did no. I? No? OK, so this is just an integration of the things. Maybe then you can see also how, how the problem with the quantile, quantile shows up, OK? Because I cannot say that uh, they don't show up. It show up. If you have independent shocks, it's very simple because everything call, collapses. That's OK. But if it's not independent shocks, then what you have is this. So the price today is the stochastic current factor from today to tomorrow, price plus dividend. Multiply here, so dividend plus the price tomorrow, right? I did not. Uh, so price tomorrow here, I can put uh, two models down, and this process, uh, I mean, this is a multiplication, right? From today for tomorrow, and tomorrow for today. The multiplication for today, two days from today. That's this uh, notation here. So the price today is this guy, I just repeated. I repeated this term. And now it's the price tomorrow. I'm going to apply the same problem. Here, On where is T plus 1? Well, that is what? Now the quantile, same thing here. The quantile of T plus 1, T plus 2, dividend and price. And then now the trick is I put everything inside. I cannot go in the other side, but I can put it in, inside. So I have quantile, of, sorry. I have quantile of the quantile of this term. This term becomes t to t plus 2, value of dividend, time of dividend, and the price. Well, now you get the idea, right? You keep doing it. What you get, an interaction of quantiles. And at the end, you get this guy here. So the price today, is the discounted value of the dividends through the stochastic quant factor evaluated not in the quantile but in this operator which is a sequence of quantiles how it compares with the standard model well very simple the only difference in the standard model is that uh, you see this operator here it's a sequence of quantiles in the standard model it's just one expect expectation why because of law our expectation we can collapse to one if the shocks are independent, this guy is also one quantile. Okay, but uh, this is the difference. Uh, and, and the nice thing is that uh, you can still <laughs> say exactly the same thing. What's the price today? The price is the quantile, what comes next, which is kind of uh, interesting as well. Uh, but that, uh, in this thing here, you get the, the point of a parameter for risk, right? Okay, so. Uh, I'll, I'll, I'll skip this discussion. There's also some discussion about price. Let it, let me go back to the. How crazy is the assumption that shocks are independent? Huh? How crazy is the assumption that shocks are independent? The the mathematical here is for math called shocks, but uh, a lot of uh, applied people use independent, independent shocks. Okay. So and if you use independent then shocks, then, then it's like, it's very simple. Just one point five. You can even create math called Shocks with uh, just the AR. The, the uh -huh. yeah, which, which then they simplify. Right? Yeah, simplifies. Yeah. Okay. okay, so let's talk about the extreme puzzle. And uh, I just will show some numbers here because I, I, I mean, there are some uh, technicalities behind it, uh, but I don't think that uh, maybe Carlos would be interested in these things. But I will skip uh, the formula. 
because the, the, the whole thing here is that you you look at the asset price model to get some formulas on how you calculate that premium uh, and I'm not getting into the detail of this. Now let's skip the technical part here. But uh, just to comment, uh, so these are some of the formulas that you get uh, in the expected utility for the equity premium, the risk-free rate, and all the parameters depend on the expected utility, the depth sign scene. It's a bunch of parameters, don't worry about this. And then here is the quantile preference. In some sense, the forms are different. The bottom line is this, uh, you take from this, the forms are different, a little bit complex. Okay, doesn't matter. No, but let me take a look at that. So the thing with here with quantile is that uh, you see this number here, you take a norm, so we're assuming that uh, the assets are not normal, and uh, the quantile of uh, the normal, you can uh, the Q tau is the quantile tau of a norm mm -hmm. distribution with uh, mean zero and uh, standard deviation one. And the nice thing is we work for the uh, uh, a normal with a mu uh, with variance sigma, you can multiply. Okay, so that, that's why the covariance. I, I was surprised that the covariance appears in the quantile, but that's true because you have the sort of normal assumption. Because okay. mm -hmm. otherwise, you would expect something a very different. Yeah, yeah, no, and then I probably don't have formulas. Right, right. And then okay, okay, okay. Very, 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 very complex. But then you could still do numeric. Numeric, right. Okay, but then uh, what we do, we take a bunch of different data sets with different uh, different uh, intervals of data. Uh, and here are the intervals. So this is this is the original Mary Prescott paper, which uh, is the, the one that originated the actual puzzle. And then a bunch of different uh, uh, numbers. So here is after the well, a little bit after the great crisis, uh, this uh, after 2000. Well, this perhaps is one of the most uh, inclusive, but you see different, uh, this, this takes out the uh, World War II. There are different uh, values, and so strange things happen or not happen uh, in some of these intervals. I do kind of try to uh, to look at uh, how our numbers will be affected by this. Uh, yeah, just the statistics of those periods. Yeah, yeah, this, yeah. This, this, I'm just describing what the numbers that we got. That is nothing of our paper here. Uh, there is a little bit of uh, uh, things in terms of uh, the implied uh, extreme, uh, but I will skip this. Let me go to the one that's really important. This is the table that's important, okay? So in this table, I'm going to compare the expected field that stands in, in our model. Here is the coefficient relative risk of motion, the expected field. For the different data sets, we we'll try to match those guys. Okay, so this coefficient of 100 or 500 or 1,000 is just fair. crazy. Right? You should go to 20. That's considered almost 20. You have to go to 100 at least 200, 500. So this is exactly what you could call the active premium puzzle. It's a puzzle because the parameters that you get do not make sense. This value here I'm putting for uh, completion, uh, completeness because it's just the inverse of this. You remember that risk aversion that was uh, one term substitution are tied together in the expected uh, So this value, this number here is the inverse of this. This is why for this guy it's a very normal, normal, normal. So, okay, this is the extreme process that we all know. Less known is the Epstein's uh, numbers. Next time, you also have a, a, a number for relative risk conversion and a number for the elasticity of the substitution. They are different. Now you go to the numbers, to the data set, with uh, try to match the number, and this all together. You should have positive relative risk conversion. Negative means that you are risk lower. So it's, it's kind of strange as well. Uh, this, this is okay, uh, but uh, you really cannot make this work. And these are the numbers that you get in the quantile. So uh, most of them are between 38 and 42, and the variance is slow. 
So you can think, what does it mean? 40, what, what does it mean? It's like you, this is telling that you are maximize a quantile 40. There is a sense in which maximize a quantile half would be risk mortality. A 40 is a little bit of a risk aversion. And you can ask, and it's a fair question, how, how strong is the uh, level of risk aversion for this game? I have two answers to this question. One is, in our lab experiment that I told you before, uh, the, remember that I put that they have the, the models compete with each other? For the quantile guys, most of the guys that got it between uh, 35 and 43. So it's very close to what you get here. And that, what's that? Oh, what looks that we are. We have to update, not now. If, if it was, I don't know if uh, Apple can allow you not to do this. Defer. Defer. Oh, yeah. Thank you. Okay. And then uh, I, have, I have some graphs on this here. We can discuss more. But uh, I'll tell you, it seems reasonable. If you go 20 or 10, maybe it's too high. But this is not, uh, not too high. And then I see some terrible substitution is a little bit above one, which is also, OK, it's not crazy. So people say that between 0 0.2 and 2, or maybe sometimes even some authors say 0, between 0 and uh, 10, it's OK. So these numbers are, are also nice. Uh, so uh, help me understand, like, we don't have a CRA for the one time one. We have the downside of the, the downside, down. yeah, the, the this is out, right? Which is where, how far you're looking at the downside, essentially, right? How pessimistic it's a noise are you, Exactly, right? exactly. Um, so your question is how you relate one to the other. Yeah, it's hard. So now I think But I'm showing, I have a slide on this. But before we get there, just the, the elasticity of interest of substitution. Um, help me understand how to interpret, like, the, the numbers coming from the effect of so being so close to zero. What does that mean in terms of intertemporal substitution? Is that I am very myopic? Is that what that? You mean this guy here? Oh, I'm sorry. This column, yeah. Is that, does that imply a, a so, myopic uh, individual? No, no. Uh, it's a very strong risk of version. So the, the utility is like, uh, it's very dramatic here. So it's as almost as you're saving a lot. So you are very cautious. It's too cautious, and this is the problem, right? Uh, the a lot of our economists who explain the extreme problem say, "Look, given the returns that you have in the stock market, everybody should be there. People should be, and, and they, should they, be. Are, they are they are too cautious, and this is what so the, the, effort, the premium should be completed away. It's not completely away. Right? Yeah. And yeah, it's not good. Uh, and the value. So, for instance. If you have just two terms of shape, elasticity of one is a log, which is kind of uh, okay. So elasticity of one, I think that it's a, it's a okay elasticity kind of uh, to that. So you may have a little bit more to the one side or the other, but uh, not much. But let me go to this question, uh, Carlos, because I think it's really important. I always keep some of yeah yeah. That's, that's exactly what's coming. I'm going to compare risk aversion in the speculative model with the risk aversion in this model. Okay, how I do this? It's actually it's very simple. Uh, maybe the map is intimidating, but it's very simple. What I do, think about the have a spectral utility of uh, log norm, and I'm restricting myself. I have to restrict the, the logics. I'm restricted log norms. Uh, the spectrum tilt of a log normal with this kind of uh, utility function is called constant relative risk aversion utility function. The, uh, the expectation of this guy with uh, a log normal with these parameters is given by this. You can calculate explicitly the form. You see, what's the value, the right value, if I don't have risk, that is, gives exactly the same utility? Is this V that you can calculate with this formula? Get this form, okay? That's the second equivalent of a log normal variable 
with uh, this kind of spectrum here. And I can do the same thing, the same lottery. What's the set equivalent of the quantile? And this is the formula. You see here that exactly because log norm exponential, the mean, the mean, the variance tells how wide it is, and then you have the quantile of the standard norm. Okay. And then uh, the, the the trick is what is just to put this number equals to this number. Okay, you equate these two guys, mm -hmm. and they're very simple. The first thing that goes out is mu, mu doesn't matter. And then they have a formula here that uh, what is left is sigma, q tau, and uh, the other side sigma and gamma. So this means, and this is the formula that relates tau, that comes from q tau, with the gamma, which is the parameter of risk aversion. Sigma is the uh, variability, the standard deviation of the log norm that we plot. And then you can plot this, and these are the numbers for the other plots. Of course, it depends on uh, the standard deviation that you get. Uh, here is the tau, so 0 0.4 is here. What's the relative risk aversion? It's around uh, 3. It's not, uh, this is risk aversion, okay? Or it goes until 7. And what I call it to say is that a relative risk aversion of up to 20, it's okay. It's reasonable. And we're getting uh, well below. And for, for numbers that are similar to what you get in the applications. So anyway, that's uh, uh, this is just in some sense to say that uh, the zip point for that gap zip point that seems reasonable beyond the uh, the thing about the other labs. And I think I have a lot of other thing. I bet off uh, Epstein Z, but I think I should stop here, right? Not not <laughs> not a good thing to to say bad things. So I'll stop here. Thank you. <laughs> So you mentioned, you mentioned the, 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 the aggregate and protocol uh, um, aspect of it, and, but you mentioned also that you did some work on the mean variance um, like results on it. And so this is another paper. I, I, can you give us a sense of you know, what happens there? Because expected utility is a very important aspect of getting us to, you know, Tangent portfolios yes. and all, all, all the stuff right there. So basically, can you work it out everything with quantiles? So that uh, particular paper, it's a it's an experimental paper. What we did is a similar uh, uh, ex uh, exercise. The other one, the lab exercise that I described to you, was a binary choices and competing the two models. What we did in the second paper was now it's not a binary choice; it's a portfolio decision. And you have to choose portfolio. And I want to compare mean variance preference with quantile preference. And uh, I don't have the precise numbers here, but the results are similar in the sense that uh, it's not that quantile preference is, is overall, overall better to explain the results, but it's like uh, one third to, depending on your count, a half of the people behave like quantile preference. I guess what I meant, what I meant is that starting from the Lucas tree model under some basic assumptions of the utility, car utility, whatever, under expected utility, I get the sort of Markowitz result, right? That that follows in the sequence. I can get the mean variance portfolio as a portfolio location becomes a result of that. You have to to add some other assumptions. Sure, there's some linearity that we would put yeah. in here, but, but there's, yeah, the, there's this big sort of connection between you know Lucas tree to to, to, to all the sharp works and, yes, and, yes. and markets. So that, that's like a paradigm finance, right? So now, if I use quantile references, then you have a lot of uh, things to do. What is the, <laughs> that's so exactly what, my point. What is that? What is the so what what is the portfolio location exercise then? I don't know. Okay, so that's, that's no. Okay. <laughs> that, that, just have, I have another paper, but it's not dynamic. It's not about pricing. It's portfolio location of quantile preference, uh, where we try to work out what happens or with uh, uh, 
uh, portfolio choice of contact maximizing. And we have uh, some paper on this. Some things you can derive uh, uh, algebraically, but most of those you have to be numerical, and it's not so easy. But what I, uh, my, my, so there is something done, but I would say that uh, the amount of things that has to be done is uh, enormous. Right. Uh, and the, the thing for the, at least for us, is like we're seeing this, uh, we can't come back, there are 50 years of finance and economics doing just speculative. Right. We just say, look, <laughs> there's a very nice thing for PhD students, right? Do the same thing of Pantaio, and then you can at least see what happens if it's interesting. At least for what I was seeing now, it's interesting. And, but a lot of low hanging fruits that uh, we just would like to have a lot of people work on this as well. Because it seems to, I mean, it's a different way of looking at things. Uh, I don't know how interesting or promising. We will learn just uh, doing it, right? But at least there's a lot of things to do. That's true. That's true. Yes? Um, what about Dutch books? Um, so Great. So are, are the quantile maximizers going to be exploitable? Great. That's a great question. So what's Dutch books? Just to explain. Uh, the Dutch book argument is the following. Uh, you you put someone to make a choice, and then uh, and then another choice, and another choice, and as people get making the choice, you go back to the original one. In the process, you just make the guy pay to you, and then you empty his pocket because his choices are not consistent in time. Because go back to what you got. So it's kind of circular. So that's a great question because it's actually, uh, in some sense, how it began this process, this project. Uh, I have to go back to this, but it's a very interesting, a very nice for, for a question. Uh, let me try to. Oops, I was in the wrong direction. Let's see. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You remember that uh, when I, I described these guys. Uh, with the cake in it, I, 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 if, you, if, you, if you take the expectation, because of the expectation, you can just put the expectation here, and then you you work, and it's equivalent to this, the reactive structure, it's a different way of looking. So when I started doing this, my first reaction is exactly to what this, because this is the standard model that you use, then you put a quantile here in front, right? That would be my first try. Then what you get? That works. And then when I start thinking about this and then I realize that what we have to do is actually to go with this structure, this structure here, where it's defined recursively. It's a, uh, the, the, the value function of uh, the t plus the quantile. See, I don't, I don't define, I don't begin with the, the, the infinite sum. I define recursively. And because of that, I can get rid of this. So, short answer, this is the long answer. With this preference, you don't have Dutch books, don't have this problem. And uh, so, dynamic hyperbolic, this thing that people are not consistent, dynamically, you don't have this problem here. You can add, exactly as Lipson did for getting the dynamic hyperbolic discounting, you can add here, here, here if you want, but it's not, uh, it's uh, consistent, dynamic consistent. That's one of the problems that we've got. It's a great question. Well, thank you again. Thank you.